on World News Tonight. A total blackout. The island of Cuba and most of the Caribbean goes into total blackouts as Hurricane Ian hits the American landmass. Mystery leaks. Suspicions of Russian sabotage spreads as leaks are detected from the Russian gas line to Europe. New territory. Russia claims annex regions as part of Russia as a result of its controversial referendum are released. Spring and summer. Italian designer Armani presents a new collection with plenty of sparkle. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Now, before taking direct aim at Florida, Hurricane Ian made landfall in Cuba as a monster Category 3 storm. Heavy rains and powerful winds left a path of destruction and plunged hundreds of thousands in darkness, including parts of Havana. Hurricane Ian slamming western Cuba early this morning. Wind gusts up to 129 miles an hour as the Category 3 hurricane tore across the island for more than seven hours, ripping roofs off homes and blowing debris into streets. 64,000 people were evacuated, many huddled in shelters. This woman describing being moved from one room to another because of fears the glass window would shatter. As people took cover inside, the wind howled outside, ripping trees from the roots and knocking transformers off power lines, damaging the country's already vulnerable grid. Half a million Cubans are now without electricity. Emergency crews scrambled to protect crops in Cuba's main tobacco-growing region. The owner of one major cigar factory describing the damage as apocalyptic. In the western province of Artemisa, more scenes of destruction. Across the country, the cleanup is just beginning. In Florida, millions are under mandatory or voluntary evacuation orders ahead of Hurricane Ian's impact. A state of emergency was also declared for the entire state. In the few hours that remain before Hurricane Ian wallops Florida, an overnight mad dash to flee. Then this traffic jam today on Alligator Alley. Cars cramming their way out of Naples and Sarasota as passengers waiting to board those very last flights at Tampa's airport, where operations shut down at 5 p.m. Every flight that they tried to get me on was booked, taken, booked, taken. This is state and local leaders plead for people to evacuate. When you have five to ten feet of storm surge, uh, that is not something that, that you want to be a, a part of. And um, Mother Nature is a very fearsome uh, 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 adversary. The concerns caroming all the way to Washington, where the president says he's surging hundreds of FEMA officials to the region. The experts say this could be a very severe hurricane, life-threatening and devastating in its impact. Across Florida, at least two and a half million now living in evacuation zones, the vast majority in Tampa's Hillsborough County. This is the fourth gas station we just tried. Um, all of them are, seem to be like out. Floridians facing the reality of a terrifying threat on their doorstep. We turn now to the mystery leaks along Russian gas pipelines to Europe. European leaders, skeptics and experts suspect a case of Russian sabotage on the infamous Nord Stream, while the Federation denies all allegations. An act of sabotage. This is what European officials are accusing Russia of after Nord Stream's operator reported two explosions around its pipeline on Tuesday causing, according to Danish energy experts, some several million cubic meters of gas to leak every hour. It's very rare that damage of this type could occur. And now, three have happened within 24 hours. We are very worried about what the reason for this could be. These images, taken by Danish armed forces, show bubbles rushing to the surface of the Baltic Sea above the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines. The leaks were detected in two gas pipelines running from Russia to Germany, emanating from Sweden and Denmark's economic zones north of Poland. Both the Swedish PM and her Polish counterpart labelled the leaks as being most likely deliberate acts, while Germany also joined in on the accusations of sabotage, its gas regulator emphasising the importance of creating new European import routes to offset reliance on Russian gas. 
A very crucial question is who, if anyone, did this. It wasn't an accident. After a perhaps slightly bumpy start, the fuel switch is underway. We will probably see further savings in the coming weeks. We know that ecologically this is not ideal. There's no question about that, but it is the path we have to take this winter and the next. Washington said they would provide support to European partners conducting an investigation into the leaks, which Copenhagen says are likely to last for a week. The Kremlin did not rule out sabotage as a reason behind the damage. Hastily staged controversial referendums in four Moscow-occupied areas in Ukraine came to an end, with Kremlin installed governments claiming victories. Watchers say that the disputed referendum paves the way for the Kremlin to announce the annexation of those regions. Voting in eastern Ukraine's so-called referendums has ended Tuesday evening. And according to early counts, 98% of votes have said yes to joining Russia in all four eastern regions. That's according to Russia's state-owned media outlets. The referendums, which were announced by Russian President Vladimir Putin last week, has been hounded as a sham, rigged and farcical attempt by Russia to illegally solidify Russia's annexation of the Ukrainian regions. Putin, however, believes differently. We are saving people from the territories where this referendum is taking place. That's the primary focus of our society and the country's attention. Ukrainian outlets have duly pointed out that the population figures Russia is citing are incorrect, since 80% of the inhabitants have fled their homes since the war began. And the main thing is that these actions, this decision of Putin, will not have any influence on the politics, diplomacy and actions of Ukraine on the battlefield. The UN has said it only supports the territorial integrity of Ukraine and its recognized borders. Brussels has gone one further and said there will be consequences in the form of sanctions for all people who have helped organize the illegitimate referendums. Counting is still ongoing, but there are now real concerns that President Putin could use the result of these disputed referendums to announce the annexation of Zaporizhia, Kherson, Donetsk and Luhansk as early as Friday. Ukraine has repeatedly made clear that a Russian annexation of any of its territories will squander all chances of a peace deal between Kyiv and Moscow. With continued volatility in the global finance market, the sterling pound plunged to an all-time low against the U.S. dollar. It's not just the British pound taking hit, but many of the world's major currencies are depreciating against the greenback. New UK Prime Minister Liz Truss recently announced plans to stimulate economic growth through the largest tax cut in 50 years. However, with the current state of the financial market, concerns are rising that the national debt will soar and inflation will become even more severe. Right now, it does seem to be pretty reckless and what the government has effectively, effectively done is, is given us some money back in terms of uh, tax cuts. So what the Chancellor gives us in terms of uh, uh, tax cuts, we're going to have it taken out in the form of higher mortgage payments, etc. Meaning that ultimately the, the, the boost to demand could be removed and all we're left with is this, this legacy of, of much larger debt. The British pound has continuously depreciated against the U.S. dollar over the past year. Sterling fell as low as $1.05 on Monday, before slightly rebounding to $1.07. In addition, with the bond market also fluctuating, the yield on the five-year government bond stood at about 4.6 percent, the highest since September 2008 during the last global financial crisis. But the British pound isn't alone. The euro also sank to its lowest against the greenback, with one euro trading for as low as 95 U.S. cents also on Monday. The same holds true for the yuan and the yen in Asia's two largest economies in China and Japan. Both governments intervened as their currencies continued to fall helplessly against the strengthening U.S. dollar. Some experts believe the current trend is similar to that of the 1997 Asian financial crisis, adding that the Korean won and the Philippine peso are the most vulnerable currencies in Asia. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News.
Welcome back. The head of the World Trade Organization has said that the world is heading towards an economic recession. Director General Nagozi Akonjo Iwela's remarks came during the WTO's annual public forum in Geneva, where she cited the war in Ukraine, climate change, the global energy crisis, and the pandemic as simultaneous drivers. Akonjo Iwela said that she is most focused on the issues of food security and access to energy, both issues that have been aggravated by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. She also stressed the seriousness of the situation by saying the WTO is in the process of revising its global trade volume growth forecast, which was already downgraded once in April. The WTO's bearish expectation for the global economy came after the parish-based OECD cut its growth forecast for the group of 20 next year. She urged central banks around the world to take action and figure out whether inflation is caused by strong demand or structural problems with supply. Rights activists in Italy are concerned about what far-right firebrand Giorgia Meloni's election as the new Prime Minister could mean for abortion and LGBTQ rights in the country. Italy's LGBT community has very real fears after a conservative bloc dominated by the far right won the country's general election. That's according to leading gay rights campaigner and political candidate for the gay party, Fabrizio Morazzo. He's worried about a possible erosion of civil rights under the new administration. We have big concerns for new generations because they are creating an ideological battle due also to the deep economic crisis because of energy and other reasons. So hate was used as a tool against a given community in many other instances in the past, which we hope won't happen again. The Nationalist Brothers of Italy group, led by Giorgia Maloney, emerged as the largest party in the September 25th ballot. She will lead the most right-wing government in Rome since World War II. As part of a conservative coalition, Maloney is allied with the League, another far-right force led by Matteo Salvini, as well as the mainstream conservative Forza Italia of former Premier Silvio Berlusconi. Marazzo fears that the bloc's conservative views may lead to discrimination for the LGBT community. If there's no action in conjunction with schools, social services, help centers risk failing to create synergy. Because you can offer support to young people, but if in the school or the place of work where the act of discrimination happens, there's no law to intervene. We can only give moral or psychological support to the people affected. Therefore, there can't be a social change. This means not only to go backwards, but also that the situation would get worse. And we are very scared about that. There is already some evidence behind Morazzo's concerns. Conservative Catholic lobby Provita e Familia has called on the new government to pick an education minister opposed to any gender and LGBT ideological colonization in schools. 45-year-old Maloney herself presents as a defender of Christian values and an enemy of what she calls gender ideology and the LGBT lobby. Explaining her position to gay parenting rights, she said that unlucky children who are up for adoption deserve the best, meaning a father and a mother. She has, however, denied suggestions that her outlook would stretch to abolishing existing legislation on abortion rights or same-sex partnerships. Maloney is not expected to take office before late October, so it's too early to say what her premiership will look like. But her party's culture spokesman remarked just last week that gay couples are not legal, later claiming he was referring only to gay couples who adopt. In terms of public opinion, an Ipsos poll in June showed that 63% of Italians backed marriage rights for gay people and 59% were in favour of gay adoptions, numbers that have increased in recent years. Voters have approved a proposed reform of the basic old age pension scheme in the ballot billed as key for Swiss domestic politics. About 50% of voters coming out in favour of raising women's retirement age from 65 from 64, whilst 55% endorsed an increase in value-added tax. 
The Swiss have voted by an extremely narrow margin in a referendum to raise the retirement age for women from 64 to 65. It's their first pension reform in 25 years. 50.6% of people voted for the measure. The left, trade unions and women's associations had rejected the increase, arguing that the state should focus first on equalizing wage earnings between men and women. It's above all a defeat for those women who work hard, have a small wage and cannot decide for themselves when to retire. Much like in other Western nations, states are under stress as a bulge of baby boomers reach retirement age. But at least we have succeeded in reforming pensions after 25 years and thus stabilizing its finances. This step was really necessary and it allows us to cope with demographic change in the coming years. In Switzerland, this is an emotive issue. Protest rallies have been held in some cities already, motivated by the pensions equalization, but also by the gender wage gap, which stands at a very high 43%. American motor giant Tesla plans to increase its production in Shanghai, China by the end of this year, which is seen as a rare move by an American company increasing production in a Chinese mainland. Tesla's Shanghai plant is not running at full tilt, despite a recent upgrade at the factory, according to sources. And despite Tesla's previous plan to run the plant at full capacity at a time when competition is growing among electric vehicle makers. Shanghai is Tesla's second largest market, so the decision for Elon Musk's EV powerhouse to produce fewer cars there is unusual. Since it opened in 2019, the Shanghai plant has sought to manufacture its maximum of 22,000 vehicles a week. But it will turn out 1,500 fewer each week through the end of the year, according to two sources. The sources did not give a reason for the decision, though one said the figure was lower than expected. Tesla's China sales jumped nearly 60 percent in the first eight months of this year, according to the China Passenger Car Association. That pace, however, is much weaker than the overall market for new energy vehicles over the same period, which saw sales more than double. One analyst told that rising competition in the next few months is expected to intensify a price war among EV makers. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. As Joe Biden heads to Florida for a political rally in a state he lost to Donald Trump, Democrats hope the president's visit might boost their candidates, hoping to shatter Republicans' hold on all the statewide elected spots. Unilever announced that CEO Alan Job would retire at the end of 2023. The British consumer products maker said its board would start a formal search for a successor to Job. The royal cipher for King Charles III was unveiled. It featured the Tudor crown and the king's initials. The version used in Scotland will feature the Scottish crown. The king selected the cipher himself from 10 designs prepared by the College of Arms. Saudi Arabia's crown prince Mohammed bin Salman, often referred to as MBS, has been appointed as the country's new prime minister. This follows a cabinet reshuffle by King Salman, in which the young brother of MBS, Prince Khalid bin Salman, was also made defence minister. Five football players of Roxborough High School were shot outside their school in Philadelphia. Investigators say two gunmen fired more than 70 shots as three teams walked away from a scrimmage. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight with Italian designer Giorgio Armani's light spring and summer collection that sparkles the runway. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe and have a good night. <laughs>